On March 11, 2011, there was an earthquake just off the coast of Japan. And that triggered a giant tsunami. And the tsunami washed over the land and it took away cars and trucks and homes and over 15,000 lives. Lucy Walker's film, The Tsunami and the Cherry Tree, documents the journey from the people's initial grief and frustration and shock through a year of rebuilding until the cherry blossoms came again. Cherry blossoms are sublimely and uniquely, exquisitely beautiful and very fleeting. In Japan, resiliency, the people's capacity for rebirth, is represented by the cherry blossom. A young woman in her movie says, every year that the trees bloom, they give us courage to keep going. They blossom as they watch over this town. They saw the tsunami, and they will see us revive. It's a beautiful story of courage and strength and hope. The Japanese are not the only ones to use a tree as a symbol of hope. More than 600 years before Jesus was born, the people of Judah and Israel were squeezed in a vice between the powerful Assyrians to the north and the mighty Egyptians to the south and to the west. Assyria eventually conquered those two little nations, and the people lost everything that gave them a sense of personhood. They lost their homeland and their temple. They lost all their possessions and their family and friends. And they even lost their freedom. And in the middle of all this mess, the prophet Jeremiah brought a message from God. The day is coming when I will fulfill my promise to the house of Israel and Judah, God said. A righteous branch will spring out of David's line. A new and just leader will come from the line of David and make the people safe and secure again. Now a prophet's job is not to foretell the future. It's to analyze the current present and then speak to that so that leaders can make a decision, a right, good decision. So in the middle of life's worst woes, of collapsing security and disorientation, Jeremiah is reminding them that God has a word, that God has a plan, that God has gracious promise which God will fulfill. Jeremiah gave them a reminder of God's promise in the image of a tree. A tree felled by the acts of brutal oppression, but one firmly rooted in the people's memories and their values from the past. Rooted in the Torah and in the history of God with them. A tree with a promise of a new strong branch sprouting, a tree that made it possible to imagine and experience a future rooted in the past and yet startlingly different from anything that they had experienced before. Where in your life do you long to return to the way things were? Where in your present do you see the sprouting of God's plan for you now? And where in your life do you see a sign of the hope for your future that it will be just and secure so that one day you might shout, just as they did, God has set things right for us. Now the Old Testament offers us God's promise, and the New Testament points to the fulfillment of those promises. And so we understand that Jesus was that promised leader of God, 
rising up from the line of David. Jesus was the branch from the stump of Jesse. Jesus came to show us what justice and righteousness look like on a personal, human level. Jesus came to show us how to live for God without military might and political power. Jesus came to heal and to save. And Jesus is the ultimate experience of God with us. And yet, people still found themselves in a wee spot of trouble. In the first century, it was the Romans rather than the Assyrians or the Egyptians that were squeezing the people. Jesus warned that the temple would again be destroyed and not one block would stand on another. And he warned that there would be wars and um, revolutions. The NIV Bible says the nations will be in anguish. Jesus warned of a time of fear and foreboding. People will again lose everything that gave them a sense of personhood. And then, and then he preached one of the very shortest parables in the Bible. Look at the fig trees. When they begin to sprout, then you see those sprouts and you know summer's coming. Just so when you see these signs of distress, you will know that the kingdom of God is near. When the signs of the time are distressful, he advises, raise your heads, look up, and your redemption will be coming. It will be drawing near. Now in the Middle East, a fig tree represents fertility and abundance. Its broad leaves offer shade, shade from the sun, and its fresh fruit is delicious. And dried, that fruit will provide nutrition all throughout their wind, winter. The ideal of life, described in Micah 4, 4, is that everyone would have their own vine and fig tree, and they would live there in peace and in security. The fig tree is a symbol of hope in the middle of a world called mad. We are to raise our eyes and to look for the hope of the Lord drawing near. In the midst of wars and revolutions, in the midst of oppression and poverty, in the midst of our own personal loss, we can look for Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, especially in our time of darkness. In the very, very beginning, God said, <coughs> let there be light. But before that, there was only darkness, and God was in the darkness. When Moses went to receive the Ten Commandments, he went up the mountain, but the mountain was shrouded in darkness. A great thundercloud had descended on it. And yet, God was in that darkness. On Easter morning, before the light began to shine, when it was still dark, Jesus was rose up from the grave. God was in that darkness. In our dark times, in our misery, in our broken-hearted, evil, frightening times, we can draw strength and hope from God because God is with us in our darkness. We can lift our heads up because our rescue is coming, our recovery is near, our revitalization is drawing close. Hope is the conviction that the desirable is obtainable. It's the belief that events will turn out for the best. Now, hope does not contradict the reality of death and destruction. Or the toll it takes when life implodes and we feel assaulted on every side. But hope, in the middle of grief, acknowledges 
that the past was real and won't be the present again, but in hope you also know that life is for today, that this is the present. Only this moment have we to embrace the courage that God gives us by being near. So in hope, we can shape our future with God. I spent the latter half of this week with my mom. My dad died at the end of August, just three months ago. And being in my parents' Florida home was, um, it's a location that's strongly entwined with memories of my dad, and so it was a bittersweet time for me. I sat in his chair. I worked in his computer nook. And I went and had coffee with his friends that he loved so and who actually knew him well. And the physicality of being in that place where he was and being with those he loved, it, it kind of reinforced the physical connection to my dad, the connection based on our senses of touch and see and smell. But all my wishing or longing was not going to make the, bring him back. Death has separated us bodily, but it has not and cannot take away the connection of our hearts, our love connections. So as I sat at his computer nook, troubleshooting my mom's new internet connection, I drew on the years of shared computer experiences and his advice to stay calm and open to the solution. And as I chatted about world events with his friends, I was joyous because I was making new memories. And because I was Peter's daughter, the daughter of an Apple guru, they asked me if I had inherited the Mac gene. And they said, oh, can you resurrect this iPad? <laughs> and I felt my dad smiled when the iPad unlocked and was restored to full function. That's how it is with God's love. In our struggles, we can feel the Lord's presence keeping us calm and open to the solution to our problems. And because the Holy Spirit works through our family and our friends and all of our congregation, then we'll find release from grief and we'll find liberation from pain. And we can stand up and look for our redemption because it is drawing near. Walking with Jesus, we will shape our future. Recently, Superstorm Sandy devastated much of the Caribbean and the east coast of the United States. Cars and trucks and homes and 196 lives <coughs> were washed away. One man's home was torn apart as a 30-foot tree fell through the middle of it. And as the cleanup trees were breaking down, as the cleanup crews were breaking down that tree to remove it, the man saved the top seven feet. And he plumped it down in the middle of his front yard and searched out some ornaments left in his house and began to decorate it. And soon his neighbors came to with the things that of their experiences of the storm with um, dust masks, and empty cups of coffee, symbols that they had survived. It was a sign of resilience, a sign of hope, a desire to rebuild in the midst of devastation. Advent is a season in which we remember that we are people of hope. We are Christmas people. We sing to Emmanuel because God is with us. And when we sense that we're lost in darkness, Advent reminds us that we are not alone. The God of hope is with us. And Jesus, 
warns us not to get distracted by the worries of the world, but to lift your eyes and look upward because Jesus, even in the midst of our difficult times, is coming close. Amen. Amen.